Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. And we are continuing our series of talks on developments in isogeny-based cryptosystems. And today we're very happy to have Luca DeFeo talking about proving knowledge of isogenies, quaternions, and signatures. And feel free to interrupt this talk with questions um, if any occur to you. Uh, Luca, is it all right for us to video this talk? Yes, it is. OK, well, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Rachel and Andrew, for the invitation. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming to this talk. Um, my uh, my goal today uh, is to keep on the on the same track that of this uh, series of seminars on isogeny based cryptography, and I want to talk about something that uh, usually mathematicians don't have uh, much familiarity with, uh, which is the the. So I have this impression that most mathematicians totally know Diffie-Hellman uh, and they know what a key exchange is, but they have not always a clear picture in mind of what a signature, a digital signature looks like not from discrete logarithms or lattices or anything. And uh, because uh, some of the um, of the people who presented in this talk recently destroyed one of the best candidates for key exchange that we had from isogenies, uh, well, we have to somehow uh, find other things to work on. And so I want to talk about this, uh, this topic of uh, signatures, which has been uh, um, active for, for a while now in isogeny based cryptography. And it's always been uh, one of those things where, where it's very frustrating because we know we can make signatures out of isogenies, but they're never as uh, satisfactory as uh, one could hope. Uh, and I will show you today that, uh, yeah, we still have these problems. Like we have nice uh, schemes now, but still we, 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 would be, we would like to have better than what we have now. Um, so without further ado, I will uh, move to the topic of today's talk, um, which is based on joint work with lots of people, uh, joint works with lots of people. Um, I'm going to try to read their names. Andrea, Giulio, Deirdre, Samuel, Taco Boris, Stephen, David, David, Antonin, Guido, Maria, Travis, Lauren, Sikar, Christophe, Jerome, Benjamin, and Lucas. Um, and I hope I didn't forget anyone. Uh, these are courses building on top of uh, 20 years of isogeny based cryptography, 25 years now, I guess. Uh, although it is a relatively young topic in cryptography, um, we have been uh, like the very first isogeny based signature scheme. And so the very first uh, proof of knowledge of isogenies was, uh, was already proposed by Kuven in his uh, seminal paper, the 97 paper uh, named The Hard Homogeneous Spaces. And uh, I think uh, Stephen in his talk, uh, Stephen Garbert in his talk, uh, presented at least a sketch of how that scheme works and how that has evolved in, in modern terms. Today, I'm going to talk more about some more modern schemes, uh, work that uh, dates back to the uh, original uh, the Feo, Jaw, and Plu uh, paper on uh, SIDH, uh, the, the one that defined SIDH and defined the SIDH. The, the, the SIDH proof of knowledge uh, and recent developments that uh, uh, that have been done by uh, all these co-authors. Um, and I don't want to assume that the audience has any prior knowledge on um, on what a proof of knowledge is uh, and on how one builds signatures. So I'm going to start from the beginning. Before, uh, I'm going to start by defining interactive proofs. Um, Sorry if you already know uh, this topic, um, but if you don't know, I, I think you will agree with me that uh, it's a it's a very cute, uh, very elegant uh, field. Uh, of course, the devil is in the details always, and then when you jump right into proof of knowledge, you discover lots of things that you would like you never learned about. Uh, that has happened to uh, to us all, but. Um, the basic idea of interactive proofs and proofs of knowledge is, uh, is very simple, and I hope you'll agree with me, it's very elegant. Um, so let's start from an interactive proof. So this is not even cryptography. This is just um, um, calculability, I guess. Uh, an interactive proof is a protocol between two parties, a, a prover and a verifier. And uh, 
there's going to be a series of messages that go from the prover to the verifier back and forth. Um, the goal for the prover is to convince the verifier of some statement. Uh, so you can imagine that, for example, the, the prover uh, knows the proof to a theorem, and he wants to convince the verifier that uh, the theorem holds. Uh, so just a Boolean statement, true or false, and the prover wants to convince the verifier that true holds. Um, so the origin of interactive proofs is not even cryptography. The idea was just to, uh, one way to convince the, the verifier that the, that the theorem holds is to show him the proof. That's, uh, that's quite obvious. And then if the proof is, for example, mechanized, the verifier can just check the proof and verify that the proof is correct. Um, but maybe the proof is too large and the verifier does not have enough many resources and the prover wants to convince the verifier that the, the theorem holds with overwhelming probability without showing the full proof. Um, and this is a, a huge field of research that has led to the PCP theorem and uh, all things that you may have heard of. Um, but um, in uh, for what we're concerned here, we're going to stick to uh, statements in uh, of um, of languages that belong to the NP class. Uh, so we will assume that there is some statement uh, S and some uh, witness W. Um, and so a statement is something like, uh, I don't know, let's take the example of discrete logarithms. Uh, the statement could be um, uh, G uh, to the A, where uh, G is some generator of some group. Oops. G is some generator of some uh, cyclic group and A is some uh, exponent. And the witness is going to be the exponent A. And uh, the verifier will only have access to the statement. So for example, it will only have access to uh, G to the A. The goal of the prover will be to, uh, in this case, the goal of the prover will be to convince the verifier that he knows the witness. So something more than, something different from proving a theorem, he doesn't, he doesn't want to prove that something holds. He wants to prove that he knows a witness um, to some statement, to some element in an NP language. Uh, and of course, one way to, uh, to, to convince the verifier would be to just send A, right? If the prover takes A and sends to the verifier, the verifier can just exponentiate G to the A. This takes polynomial time in the size of the group because it's just binary exponentiation. And so the verifier can then just check equality. Uh, but then some goal may be to uh, convince the verifier that the prover knows this, uh, this exponent A without showing the exponent. Um, possibly without revealing any information in the exponent. And this is where cryptography comes in. And this is where we talk about zero knowledge proofs, proofs that reveal nothing other than the fact that some statement holds. And so when we talk about interactive proofs and uh, zero knowledge proofs in particular, usually like always, we want to uh, satisfy three properties for this proof. Um, the first is correctness. Uh, that is that um, the honest prover always succeeds in convincing the verifier. This is something I will not talk much about because any it's usually obvious. Like you define your scheme and then it's obvious. It's it's trivial to check that the, the scheme is correct. If the prover is honest, follows the protocol, and knows the witness, then the verifier will always be convinced. So this is the easy part. I will not talk more about it. And Let's uh, let's be clear on what I mean by honest prover, uh, because I will talk about honest and dishonest provers, honest and dishonest verifiers, uh, and they do not mean exactly the same thing. By honest prover, I mean a prover who follows the protocol and who knows the witness. So with respect to this uh, picture here, the honest prover has the statement, of course, that's public data, and has W, has the witness. And he follows the protocol and tries to convince the verifier. Uh, a honest verifier will be just a verifier that follows the protocol. There is no knowledge impl implied uh, with the verifier, of course. Um, a dishonest verifier will be a verifier who uh, tries to deviate from the protocol, send some messages that do not fit the format of the protocol. Um, I won't talk much about uh, dishonest provers. Usually it's enough to prove things for honest provers. And then you have general theorems that generalize uh, results to any kind of prover, uh, verifier. Sorry. 
Okay, now next thing, and this is where things start getting interesting, it's soundness. Soundness is the complement to uh, correctness. Uh, it is the property that a dishonest prover has a negligible chance of convincing the verifier. Uh, now, we don't ask this to be impossible. We just ask this, uh, this to happen with negligible chance. Uh, negligible will mean uh, exponentially decreasing in some uh, parameter. And then usually when you instantiate in practice in cryptography, you will set your security parameter uh, so that the probability of, uh, and then you will configure your uh, interactive proof scheme so that the probability of uh, a dishonest prover convincing a verifier will be uh, exponentially small in this security parameter. And here, dishonest prover means the prover does not know the weakness. Um, a stronger statement than just soundness is what is called knowledge soundness. Uh, sometimes you can see this uh, named extractability. Um, and whenever a scheme satisfies knowledge soundness, we say it is a proof of knowledge. And so this is the main topic of my talk today, is the existence of an algorithm, uh, an algorithm that we call the extractor. And that uh, this is, an algorithm that interacts with uh, a black box. Uh, the black box is a prover, um, P star, I write here. Uh, this prover may be the honest prover or maybe some dishonest prover. Uh, the only thing that we ask is that if this prover manages to convince a very, by the, the verifier with non-negligible probability, then the extractor by interacting with the prover, so essentially by playing like the verifier, uh, can extract a witness for the statement with no negligible probability. Um, and so this is this is really what, uh, what it means to prove knowledge of something, because not only I prove that some statement is true, uh, in the example before, not only I prove that there is an exponent a such that g to the power a is equal to uh, the public element s, uh, I'm proving that I do know this, uh, this, uh, this a. And so extractability means that if a prover is able to, um, to convince a verifier, uh, then this extractor can, can manage to, um, uh, to extract the exp uh, this secret exponent, for example. Now, where's the catch? Like, if this was simple like this, then it, this would mean that after a few interaction with verifiers, everyone could know the secret. So it doesn't look very, uh, very useful. But now um, the, the important uh, thing is that the extractor, uh, actually I said something that's wrong. The extractor does not have black box access to, um, to the prover. The extractor actually controls the prover and in particular it controls the randomness of the prover. And so uh, it will be able to choose to, to essentially, it cannot see what's happening inside the prover, but it can decide what random choices the prover will make. And by controlling the random choices of the prover and running it several times, it will be able to extract the weakness. Um, so this is, I think we will see one in action and then it will be clear uh, how this works. Um, there is an even stronger uh, property which is called special soundness, which implies knowledge and soundness and which I will define later. Uh, when, uh, uh, when I will come to, uh, to a specific class of Sigma protocols, uh, specific class of interactive pro uh, protocols, sorry. And then the last, um, the last uh, property we're interested in is zero knowledge. This famous uh, important property, uh, the fact that the, the prover, the honest prover this time, um, by running the protocol does not reveal any information on his secret. Um, so this feels a bit magic. How, how can you prove that a statement is true without revealing anything about the witness? And the way this is formalized, this is very elegant, is by showing a simulator. So a simulator is an algorithm that can reproduce uh, something that we call a transcript. Uh, a transcript is just the sequence of messages between the prover and a verifier. And this time the verifier can be a, a dishonest verifier. Um, and so for every dishonest verifier, we ask that there exists a simulator that is able to reproduce an exchange of messages. So this simulator does not have access to uh, the prover. The simulator just knows how the verifier works because it's uh, the, the quantification is on for every verifier, there is a simulator. 
So the simulator will reproduce an exchange of messages, but uh, will will not interact with anything. We'll just ex uh, output a transcript that looks like a real conversation between the prover, the honest prover, and the dishonest verifier. And then we ask that this transcript is identically distributed uh, to the real exchange between the prover and the verifier. Or sometimes we may ask for something slightly weaker uh, because it may be difficult to get uh, the exact identical distribution. We'll ask that the distributions are statistically close. And so you can see the intuition here is that if a simulator that in particular does not have access to uh, the witness cannot even interact with the prover, uh, if a simulator is able to reproduce the same exchange of messages that the honest prover would do with, the, with any verifier, then this means that the exchange of messages doesn't contain any information on the secret, because that's something that only the prover has. And so this is very elegant, and we will see that it's very simple, at least for some simple schemes, it's very simple to, uh, to define the simulator and everything works, uh, works out nice. Um, a special case of... Uh, uh, zero knowledge is what is called honest verifier zero knowledge. And it's exactly the same definition, but instead of asking for every possibly dishonest verifier, we just ask that this property holds for the honest verifier. Uh, so of course, this is a weaker statement, uh, but it's usually uh, fairly easy to go from honest verifier zero knowledge to full zero knowledge by some generic transformations. So typically we just uh, bother with proving honest verifiers in all knowledge, and then we just say generic proofs, generic theorems, uh, don't, we don't do the proof until the end. And it's the same I will do here. I will show some, uh, very, uh, some simulators, but only for the honest verifier because it's much simpler. Luca, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Just to clarify this, when you say a uh, potentially dishonest verifier, presumably the they still have to flip coins, right? I mean, if you're talking yes. about a distribution, you're you're measuring that distribution over coin flips, even if the dishonest ver verifier ignores them, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mean, a dishonest verifier could be the verifier that always asks the same question, has no randomness. That's a fairly easy thing to simulate, so it's not the most interesting one. Um, dishonest verifiers may do funky things, may, may try and uh, trick, um, we will see now in uh, in the case, I will I will explain what the schema protocol is, but because, because there is an exchange of messages, um, the verifier could try and adapt his responses in, uh, as a function of the messages that come from the prover. And there is, uh, depending on the protocol, there is a proper way of sending messages to the prover, and there may be dishonest ways of sending messages to the prover. When we talk about, uh, yeah, distribution, so being statistically close to the real distribution, we are quantifying over the randomness of both the honest prover and the dishonest verifier. Thank you. You're welcome. And now uh, one, yeah, one uh, other restriction uh, to make things even simpler, I will only talk about something that is called Sigma protocols. Um, these are three move public coin interactive proof systems. Um, so what does this mean? Three moving means that there's only three messages. So there is the prover here, there is the verifier here. It starts with a message from the verifier to from the prover to the verifier. This is usually what we call the commitment message uh, because it commits the prover to answer something in the future. Um, then we have a challenge that comes from the verifier to the prover. Um, and, uh, and finally, we have a response that the uh, prover will uh, send back to, uh, the, uh, to the verifier. Uh, so this is what three move means. It's only three messages. And the order of the messages must always be prover, verifier, prover. Uh, it wouldn't make much sense in the other direction. You would waste one message. Um, public coin means that uh, the message from the verifier um, so it means that the randomness of the verifier is public. Everyone can see it. Um, and so in particular, the, commit, the the message that comes from the verifier could be generated by anyone. I mean, the prover could play the protocol with himself if he wanted. He could decide on a message M, then flip some coins to get the challenge C, and then answer R. Of course, this is not how we will go, but this is what public coin means. And an example of how a Sigma, of how an interactive protocol could 
could not be public coin could be, for example, if the message C is, uh, for example, some um, some exponentiation in a discrete log group. So like A is taken at random uh, and uh, from uh, Z mod P. And then uh, the, the, com the, 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 the challenge is uh, G to the A. And of course, this is not public coin because if the verifier keeps secret the exponent, the prover has no way of knowing what, what the exponent is. Uh, it, it would have to break a discrete log random group. So this is typically the thing that we don't allow in a uh, public coin protocol. Um, so this restriction is very convenient because once you have Sigma protocols, there is a very standard uh, way to transform an interactive Sigma protocol in a non-interactive protocol uh, from which then you can get signatures, for example. Uh, this is called the fiat Shamir transform. You may have heard, heard of the name. Um, and uh, Every single signature scheme based on isogeny that we know of today is a fiat Shamir transform of some sigma, uh, sigma protocol. Um, we would be very happy to find a signature scheme that is not obtained this way. Uh, just even if it wasn't a good scheme, it would just be something new and we would be excited about it. But this is, if you like, the first open problem I can give you. Can you come up with a digital signature that is not a fiat Shamir transform of a sigma protocol? Um, it's not that easy. It's, it's in general very easy to come with uh, interactive Sigma protocols. And then once you have those, you can easily uh, derive signatures. In fact, there are even generic theorems that tell that say that for any NP uh, language, there exists a uh, Sigma protocol. Uh, so this means that for any NP statement, you could, from any kind of NP problem, you could derive a, a signature scheme. Um, and so when you talk about, when you talk with cryptographer about zero knowledge proofs, usually what they have in mind is these generic protocols that work for any NP uh, language, not some specific problem like proving knowledge of an isogeny. Um, so in, in a way where uh, we are big players, we're playing with a very special case that and when cryptographers look at it, they, they are not so interested. It, it looks complicated, lots of complicated maths, and it's very ad hoc. Uh, but of course, the reason to work with the ad hoc problems is that if you apply these generic uh, uh, protocols that work for any MP language, uh, it is very inefficient. And uh, you won't get efficient signatures. Um, although, although um, if you follow the NIST post quantum competition, one of the signature schemes that's uh, uh, the still running in the competition, if I, uh, did it get out of the third round? I don't remember. Picnic is based on a generic uh, transform on a generic protocol to prove knowledge, uh, and the MP statement in this case is the knowledge of. Um, a clear text for some uh, symmetric uh, from some cipher text in uh, with respect to some symmetric uh, encryption scheme. Um, but yeah, in general and especially for isogenies, we are more interested into getting ad hoc schemes that uh, let let us prove a specific statement about isogenies, um, and hopefully we can get some um, uh, some efficient signature schemes from them. Um, signature schemes are not the only application of Sigma protocols. You can get lots of other things. I won't talk about them, but uh, there's lots and lots of interesting uh, reasons to, uh, to, to prove knowledge of uh, isogenies and so to define Sigma protocols that prove knowledge of some secret isogeny. And now I can say what special soundness means. Uh, and special soundness, usually we will talk about two special soundness, but it can be defined more generally. Actually, we will need three special soundness in the examples I will give later, um, is uh, the existence of an, ex of an algorithm, uh, an extractor, that extracts the witness from n transcripts that share the same initial message. Um, so the, 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 the initial message must be the same, but the three challenges, the, the n challenges must be different. Um, and so usually it's enough to show that given n distinct, uh, n, uh, n transcripts with the same initial message, but distinct challenges, from those transcripts, you can recompute the, uh, the witness. It's, it's enough to have that to, uh, to get knowledge uh, soundness, so to, to define an extractor that works by interacting with the prover. Uh, 
And the way this interaction is made is by doing what is called rewinding. So maybe you heard some cryptographers talk about rewinding, 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 um, or maybe the forking lemma. You, you heard about the forking lemma. And this is what it is about. Like if you have a special sound protocol, uh, then uh, the way you define the extractor for uh, the generic, uh, like in the in the generic sense, is that you use the prover as a box where you control the randomness and you always input the same randomness. So if the prover always has the same randomness, it will always produce the same message, the same first message. And then you play with this box by submitting different uh, challenges. And by repeating these n times, eventually you get to learn the weakness. Um, was this clear so far? Any mm, things that you missed? I think it's a good moment to ask questions. OK. So I guess it's time to see a concrete example. And so I will show you a zero knowledge proof of knowledge for discrete logarithm groups. And maybe Stephen already showed it uh, to you, or, or at least something very similar. Um, this is not how we do uh, signatures in reality. I will talk later about how we do signatures from discrete log groups. But for, for example, it's very, it's very convenient. So let's say I have a group generated by some element G and uh, I have G to the S, which you can think of as my public key. So this is going to be my public key. G is going to be a public element. Uh, and I want to prove knowledge of uh, the exponent S. Um, so one way to do this is to take a random exponent k raised to g power r, and then we will make this the initial message. So if we, I can draw it here, I guess, the first message is going to send uh, g power, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm mixing letters. Uh, I wanted to write k here g power k. So the first message from prover to verifier is just sending g power k. Now the verifier will uh, send a binary challenge, just a bit, b equals 0 or 1. Um, and this bit signifies, please reveal to me one of two possible answers. Um, so if uh, b is 0, then uh, the message that the prover will send will be uh, k. This random exponent here that has nothing to do with the secret, so clearly doesn't reveal anything about s, obviously. And uh, if b is equal to 1, then what should the... the the prover send. Of course, it won't send S, that would be revealing the secret, but something that can easily be sent is uh, the arrow that links G power S to G power K. So this is S minus one times K. Um, so if K was chosen uh, uniformly, um, then S minus one minus one power K is also a uniform element. And so you, you see that the distribution of these messages is very easy to simulate because no matter what, uh, what bit is sent, in the end, you just need to choose a, um, a random message. Uh, you, need, uh, you just need to choose a, a random element of, uh, of the group. Um, um, so Sorry, a random exponent, apologies. And now, to convince you that this works, what does the, the verifier do? Well, of course, if b was equal to zero, the verifier will check that g to the power k is equal to the initial message, is equal to n. And if the bit was equal to one, it will check that the public key g power s to the power s minus one times k is again equal to the initial message. Uh, if so, the the, the verifier is satisfied and outputs, yes, I am convinced that the prover knows S with some probability. Now, of course, what's the probability that uh, the, um, the prover knows S? One easy strategy for the prover to cheat if he doesn't know S is to try and guess the bit. So if the bit is guessed correctly, um, let's, 
let's go, go back to the protocol. I have G, I have G power S. This is the public key, but I don't know this. I don't know this element here. So what, I, what can I do to, um, uh, to trick, to cheat the verifier? If I'm guessing B equals zero, then I will just choose a random K, publish G power K, and then because B is going to be equal to zero, because I, my, my guess was correct, I will just send K. And if instead I was guessing for the bit, let's call this K prime. And if instead was, was, I was guessing for the bit one, I will choose a random exponent K prime I will raise the public key to this exponent k prime, and then I will commit my initial message will be this. So one time out of two, I can cheat uh, the verifier. Um, so this is not extremely convincing, right? Like I have 50% chance of convincing the verifier. So what's the trick? How do we make this into a protocol where soundness holds with negligible probability? We iterate the same protocol many times. Uh, each time I have only 50% chance of successfully convincing the verifier if I don't know the, the secret. So if I repeat it n times, my probability of success decreases to two to the power minus n. Um, and so I just need to, like if you want to, uh, to, to reach some negligible probability, like some concretely negligible probability, I need to repeat the protocol a hundred times, couple of hundred times, and I will get to a sufficiently low probability. Um, so this is something that we will see a lot. We will always see protocols where the probability of successfully, successfully cheating is rather high, and then the protocol must be repeated enough times to make the probability decrease exponentially. This picture is also showing that the protocol is uh, zero knowledge because now it's clear how a simulator can work. Because the simulator does not interact with the, with the verifier. The simulator must just uh, simulate the interaction between the, let's just talk the honest verifier and the prover. Then the simulator can decide in advance what the challenge bit is going to be. So the simulator will first choose the bit B, then act like this cheating uh, prover that I'm just showing, and then finally decide on the first message. End. So the way the simulator works is just by playing the messages not in the same honest order because the simulator has the freedom to, to choose the things in any order. Um, because we have parallel repetition of the protocol, then we, we must show that this holds even when the power protocol is uh, repeated many times, but the proof is rather mechanical. There is no big surprise. So I hope everyone is convinced that this protocol is zero knowledge. Um, I hope I also convince you that there is a one out of two, um, uh, like th that the verifier is convinced with 50% uh, chance. But if I want to really uh, motivate that this protocol is a proof of knowledge, I must show you an extractor, or more simply, I must show you that it is two special sounds in this case. And it's actually, again, something that's very easy to show that it's two special sounds. Let's, uh, let's now go back to uh, some uh, possibly dishonest verifier who doesn't know the secret. Um, and let's go back to G power K here. Uh, here I have K, here I have S minus one times K. Well, what was the definition of two special soundness? I need um, two different transcripts with the same initial message. So I need G power K, bit b is equal to zero, k, this is the first transcript. And then I need the second the transcript, which is going to be the same initial message, g power k, a different challenge, one, and the response to the, uh, to the challenge, s minus one k. Now, if, if the prover manages to convince the verifier with no negligible probability, then you see that this is the only possible answers that like k and s minus one k are the only possible answers that the prover must reply with 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 the uh, overwhelming probability. And now if I have these two, it's obvious how I recover uh, the secret. I just do uh, k divided by s minus one k. That's s. And so I extract the secret. 
And so I proved the two properties. I didn't show you cor correctness to you. Uh, I hope you are all convinced that the protocol is correct. That's usually the, uh, that's always the easy part. Um, and this is how it always works. This is how you make any kind of uh, interactive Sigma protocol. Um, you have these three properties to show and they are pretty easy to, um, like if the protocol is good, they're pretty easy to, um, uh, to prove. It's, it's rather straightforward. If they do not hold, then that's where you need to start thinking, hmm, how do I need to change this protocol, change a little bit things so that I finally can reach my properties. And I will show you, starting from something that doesn't quite reach the properties that we want, how we get to some pro protocol that has the properties that we want. Um, just a small parenthesis, I think uh, I'm sure that Stephen talked to you uh, talk, uh, talk to you about this uh, in his talk, uh, but the same protocol that I showed you is uh, what is used for uh, schemes based on uh, complex multiplication, like for example, Seaside, which has been certainly talked a lot um, uh, in, this, uh, in this series. Um, in Seaside, instead of having a discrete logarithm group, you have a cryptographic group action. Um, so the only things that change in the protocol is that instead of having a group generator, you have some start analytic curve is zero, this is going to be, for example, some super singularity curve over FP. And then you have a secret um, ideal, ideal class that uh, I'll try to write as a fracture A that maps to some curve E1 again over FP, for example. And you want to prove knowledge of, um, of this secret ideal. And so like you certainly seen the notation probably with a star for the group action, because you know that there is this uh, group action of the class group of, for example, in the case of C side is going to be uh, Z adjoin square root of minus P onto, well, how ugly is it? Uh, this group is acting onto the set of super senior elliptic curves um, with complex multiplication by the same uh, by the same class group, uh, I guess LP. Uh, I, I write something like this. Um, and now, yeah, the protocol goes exactly the same. Uh, the first message is the commitment to some uh, let's call it K action on E zero, and then you will either reveal K or you will reveal um, A minus one times. Um, and then you need to repeat this many times and uh, you get something that is a signature scheme. Uh, you have several choices. You have uh, something that's called C sign. You have something that's called C fish. Oops, there's a capital here. C fish. Uh, which are more or less efficient, more or less useful. Um, and which have been at the center of a lot of research uh, in isogeny based cryptography. But I don't want to talk about these schemes uh, because I think they, are, they have already been covered uh, sufficiently good during the series. I want to talk about the other schemes, the other proofs of knowledge. And this is where I realized that I should have taken a clock because I don't know how I'm doing with time. Can someone tell me? Uh, you've got about 20 minutes left. Okay, ah, as low as usual. Okay, so, uh, and this is where I talk about super senior isogeny graphs. I don't want to define them because they have been uh, defined many times during the series. So I just some reminders on, um, uh, on how, what they are and what their properties are. Um, so, a super singular isogeny graph has four nodes, all super singularity curves defined over uh, the algebraic closure of some finite field. And so, because all J invariants are defined over FP square, we can just focus on uh, super singular curves over FP square. Uh, it has roughly, and the edges between uh, the edges of the graph are the isogenies of some fixed degree, um, usually a prime degree, uh, between these uh, super singularity curves. So it has roughly uh, p divided by 12 nodes, 
uh, it is undirected and L plus one regular outside of some two except possibly exceptional vertices seen in the J invariants zero and 1728. Uh, but those are a technical detail, if you wish. You can always, whatever you can prove for, uh, for the general case uh, for, for these graphs works, but you need to, to touch a little, a little bit the proof to take uh, those two special vertices into account, but that's it. They are connected. There is a single connecting component, uh, which in particular means implies that uh, if you look at the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix of the graph, the largest eigenvalue in um, in absolute value will be exactly equal to L plus one, the degree of regularity. And they have the Ramanujan property, which is going to be very important, uh, which tells you that uh, all other eigenvalues, except the, the first one, um, are um, bounded in uh, in absolute value by two times square root of uh, L, so the degree of regularity minus one. Um, and so this is uh, Ramanujan graphs are sometimes called optimal expanders because in terms of the expansion properties of the graphs, this is the best you can hope for. Um, and in particular, the thing that we will need is that Ramanujan graphs have rapid mixing. And I think this is something that was already talk, discussed uh, by Christine Lauder, for example, in her first talk, how these rapid mixing properties uh, let, are very convenient because with very short walks, logarithmic in, the, in P, in the size of the graph, you can get very close to the uniform distribution on the graph very fast. And so these make very good uh, hash function and even interesting, uh, cryptographically interesting hash functions. Um, and so my goal here would be, uh, let's prove knowledge of some isogeny walk in the L isogeny graph between two elliptic curves. So E0 and E1 are going to be two super singular curve, elliptic curves, both defined over FP square. Um, and my secret, uh, of which I want to prove knowledge, is going to be uh, an isogeny, which I'm going to call maybe phi, uh, of degree L power uh, n, n being the length of the walk. And let's keep concrete things concrete. Let's just say that the degree of phi is 2 power n. Okay, so. Of course, it could be any other small prime, but let's uh, let's say L is equal to two. So I'm talking about walks in the two isogeny graph. Um, how can I prove knowledge of the secret isogeny? Of course, one would be tempted to do the same thing as we did before, right? Uh, I will commit to something here, to some E2 here, uh, and then I will, uh, according to some bit equal to zero or one, I will reveal either one or the other side of this diagram. Um, the problem is, um, sure, this side of the diagram, it's fine. Uh, it's not related to the secret. But this side of the diagram is clearly related to the secret. And I need to find a way uh, such that um, this, uh, this arrow does not contain information on the secret isogeny phi. So this is the real problem. How, how can I do this? Um, and in particular, like having this zero knowledge means that I want to be able to simulate this arrow. Um, and now this is not obvious uh, because isogenies uh, between super singular uh, elliptic curves in general over FP square uh, are, not, um, are not represented by elements of some class, uh, some class group. So you, it's, uh, it's, it's quite more complicated to talk about the distrib like. First of all, there is no group action, so I cannot talk about distribution of elements in some group. Uh, there is a, still an action of some ideals on uh, on these elliptic curves, but it's more complicated, and I'm going to come back to to that uh, later. Um, what can I do? The first idea uh, that uh, dates back to uh, the original SIDH paper uh, is let's do something like this. Let's take uh, an isogeny phi of degree, uh, so this of degree two power n, 
And let's take this of co prime degree three power n. Okay, now there is an easy way to close this diagram. There is an obvious way to close this diagram, which is to take the push out. So I can take phi prime here of degree two power n and psi prime here of degree three power n and get to some elliptic curve E3. Um, and uh, I will do this generic. I will, uh, I will just take the, uh, the universal construction for, for this diagram, um, which is easy because to compute phi prime, for example, I can take the kernel of phi and push it through the isogeny psi. And vice versa, to compute psi prime, I can take the kernel of psi and push it through the isogeny of phi. Um, now, uh, instead of having a bit challenge, I will uh, take a trick challenge. So um, my protocol will look something like this. Uh, I should have reserved more space. The prover will send E2 and E3 as the first message, the commitment message. This forces the prover to some diagram. And then the verifier will respond with a challenge, which is going to be either zero or one or two. So we'll ask, please reveal uh, one of uh, the three possible sides of this diagram. Um, and then according to zero, one or two, or two the, um, the verifier, the prover, we reveal, uh, let's say psi, this is ugly. We reveal psi phi prime or psi prime. And as you can see, of course, neither psi nor psi prime reveal anything on phi. Um, phi prime, it's, it's more subtle. Uh, it's unclear what phi prime reveals on, uh, on the secret phi. Um, now, in the original SIDH paper, it was remarked that even taking psi and psi prime together, so doing this modification to the protocol, where the first message is the same, the second message is going to be uh, zero or one, and then the answer is going to be in the first case, in the zero case, I reveal psi and psi prime together, and in the second case, it's going to be just revealing phi prime. Um, so in the, in the original paper, we observed that this didn't seem to um, reveal the secret. Uh, indeed, if it did, SIDH would be broken. Um, and so we conjectured that this would be a uh, sufficiently secure uh, sigma protocol for proving knowledge on isogeny. Well, it turns out SIDH is broken. So clearly this protocol is also it's not broken, actually. This is the cool thing with uh, Sigma protocols with interactive proof of knowledge. It doesn't show that the protocol is broken. It just shows that the protocol that, that there is an even simpler protocol uh, for proving knowledge of an SADH uh, secret, which is just give away the secret. Anyway, anyone can compute it. So it's not it's in it's in it's in P. So the proof is trivial. Um, so you can never get any uh, scheme broken uh, if you only work on interactive proofs of knowledge. Um, so which after the shock I've taken, I guess this is going to be the rest of my life. Uh, but now, since this one now doesn't work anymore, let's focus on the first variant. The first variant, which was just hinted at in the, the original, um, the FAO John and Blue protocol. And let's think about the two properties, um, soundness and, um, and uh, zero knowledge. So let's start with soundness. Now with soundness, again, you need to suppose that the prover is dishonest. So the prover doesn't know phi. And actually because of the way we're setting uh, things, uh, sorry, E2, E3, because the way the, the things are set, we can't even assume there exists an isogeny, again, there exists an isogeny of degree uh, two power n between E0 and E prime. So um, can you extract the isogeny phi from uh, seeing the three sides of this diagram? Um, if the sides of the diagram are produced on it, honestly, uh, then yes, you can definitely extract an iso uh, the isogeny phi because if you have 
phi prime and you, if you have psi, well, then you can just take phi prime and push it, push its kernel through uh, the dual of psi and you will recover the kernel of phi. So from an interaction with the honest prover, then you can definitely extract phi. But if you recall now the definition of uh, extractability of uh, knowledge soundness, you must also account for this honest prover. And in particular, you must account for the case where uh, there is just no isogeny phi. This is also possible. And in this case, of course, you cannot extract an isogeny of the right degree because it doesn't even exist. Um, so actually, this went unnoticed for nearly 10 years. Um, and it's only thanks to uh, Stephen uh, and Samuel and Lucas that I someday I got this email in my inbox uh, asking whether I hadn't made a mistake in the original uh, proof of extractability. And indeed, it turns out that just uh, the protocol, as I uh, described it to you, is not enough to guarantee the existence of phi. And so it's not enough to provide a sound sigma protocol for the knowledge of uh, an isogeny phi of degree two power n. This is maybe not so bad because you can definitely extract an isogeny between E0 and E1 from this uh, diagram. It's just the composition of psi, phi prime, and the dual of psi prime. And this is already a non-trivial statement. So you could use this protocol for signatures. It would still be interesting because given two generic super singular curves, it is hard to find any kind of isogeny between them. So maybe for signatures, there is no need to extract precisely uh, an isogeny of the correct degree. But if you're really interested in extracting an isogeny of degree two power n, then you need to enrich this protocol. And so um, the, um, the idea that uh, we, uh, we, uh, we developed in a paper with Stephen, Lucas, and uh, Samuel was to commit to somehow some, somewhat more information. We'll commit to E2 and E3, but we also need to commit to the kernels of psi and uh, psi prime in a way that lets us prove that psi and psi prime are somehow parallel isogenies. Uh, by parallel, I mean that uh, their kernels are the push forward of one another through uh, phi prime. And so the way to do this while still maintaining zero knowledge, it's a bit tricky. You need to commit to some uh, basis of, um, so if degree of psi is uh, three power m, you will need to commit to the e three power m torsion, e two three power m torsion here, and to a specific generator of kernel of psi here. And then here you will need to do the same. You will need to commit to uh, the E3 bracket three power M torsion and to dual and to the kernel of psi prime dual. Uh, and then you will need the verifier to check that everything is consistent, that uh, psi is, is an isogeny from E0 to E2, that psi prime is an isogeny from E1 to E3, that uh, phi prime is an isogeny from E2 to E3, that the kernel of psi dual is the push forward, uh, sorry, that the kernel of psi prime dual is the push forward of the kernel of psi dual through phi prime. And when all these conditions are met together, then you can be sure of the existence of phi, which in practice means that there is much more you need to commit to some uh, P2 and Q2 generators for um, the um, the kernel of uh, generators for the torsion of E2. You need to do, to commit to some three, P3, Q3, which are generators from the three power m torsion of E3, and then you need to commit to some coefficients, call them a and b, such that kernel of uh, psi hat is uh, generated is equal to uh, a p2 plus b q2. Um, and then of course, you cannot commit to all of this in one go because this is too much information. This lets you um, uh, recover the, um, uh, the isogeny phi. So you will need to uh, put these things into boxes and only reveal them little by little. 
Um, so the protocol gets quite complicated and we were really not happy with uh, what we got. Uh, but uh, at least we finally uh, had a very complicated proof of knowledge for an isogeny of a precise degree. Um, but then zero knowledge is another problem. And um, this is what I want to highlight. Uh, how do you prove zero knowledge? Now, let's think about this. Is zero to, there is some isogeny phi, but I don't know it. How can I simulate the protocol? Well, of course, if I am asked to reveal Psi, I can just take any random uh, isogeny Psi and reveal it. If I'm asked to reveal, uh, so maybe I should draw them separately. So this is the simulation for the first kind of challenge. The simulation for the uh, last kind of challenge will be also something like this. And the simulation for the challenge that I had called uh, one, the, the challenge three t equal to one, will be something like this. Uh, now, we need to think about the distribution of these things. Can the simulation be distributed identically to the real distribution? Okay, the first case here, it's fine because I just need to take a random isogeny psi. The second case here is also fine because uh, if psi is uniformly distributed among all isogenies of degree three power m, psi prime is also going to be uniformly distributed among all isogenies of degree three power m. But this one, well, this one is tricky uh, because I cannot, like, how do I choose E2? I, I cannot choose a random isogeny, a, a random elliptic curve of uh, a random super singular curve because the property that defines E2 and E3 is that they are both a distance two power, uh, 3 power m from E0 and E1. And if I'm trying to uh, cheat without knowing the secret isogeny, I can achieve this for one or the other. So for example, I could take a walk of degree 3 power m from here, but then I wouldn't be able to compute this one uh, because I don't know the secret. Uh, so I can only consistently uh, have E2 or E3 distributed the same way as in a real uh, protocol, but I cannot have uh, both distributed consistently. And so um, in a way you can say, well, uh, okay, maybe I cannot have the same distribution, but the two distributions are at least computationally indistinguishable. And this is how this has always been solved. I didn't define it, but there is a, a definition of computational zero knowledge, which is the same definition I gave, but instead of asking that the distributions are identical, I just ask that no polynomial time algorithm can distinguish between them. But this is not totally satisfactory. And in some cases, this is really not what you want. You really want to have a uniform, uh, a, 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 an identically distributed, or at least statistically close, uh, distribution for uh, all possible uh, challenges. And so this is a problem that uh, recently we were faced with because we really cared about statistical zero knowledge. And so, uh, skip this, we came, uh, we started thinking very hardly about this third case because this is the tricky one. So I have some isogeny phi between E0 and E1, and then I have some square and some isogeny E2 to E3. So this is the honest distribution. This is the distribution of the real protocol. And then I have the dishonest distribution. The dishonest distribution is a distribution where the isogeny here is unknown, um, and then I can take here an isogeny that's distributed as it should, but then I will take, uh, maybe let me draw this differently. Then I will take some uh, random isogeny here to E3. 
Okay. And so I have no guarantee that uh, the top and the bottom sides are parallel in a sense. Um, is it possible to change the protocol so that uh, these things come, become equally, uh, becomes identically distributed? Uh, the answer is yes, and intuition is pretty uh, clear if you are a bit familiar with uh, expander graphs. Uh, you realize that, sure, if uh, E0 is too close to E2, then these two distribution will be different. But if I start taking uh, this length M, this length here, if I start to taking it long enough, at some point, this distribution should converge to the same distribution eventually. And actually, it's it's very cute the way you prove this, uh, and uh, this is by having changing a little bit's perspective. And instead of looking at these diagrams like this, you want to look at diagrams which are so the same picture, e zero and kernel of phi. So, and here you have e two psi. E2 and kernel of, uh, sorry, not kernel directly, but psi kernel of phi. So this is the honest distribution. Like if you compare now the two slides, you can see here I was talking about squares and now I'm replacing the, the information about phi about with its kernel, which is computationally the same thing. And the dishonest distribution will be, here I have E0 and kernel of phi, but here, because I don't know the kernel of phi, I can only have E2 and some random kernel, which I call G. And this is very tempting. Uh, now, at this point, what you want to do is to define the graphs whose nodes are these things here. Instead of looking at graphs whose nodes are super singularity curves, you want to know, look at graphs whose nodes who are pairs of super singularity curves as some cyclic uh, groups, so some kernels of isogenous or cyclic isogenous. And this leads to the definition of graphs with level structure. These are exactly what I said. Um, so in particular, what we call the Bohr level structure is the graph where nodes are pairs E, G, where E is a super singularity curve and G is a cyclic gr group of some order N, capital N, which could be three power N, for example, uh, two power N rather. And vertices uh, without the typo, uh, would be uh, you would connect two nodes whenever there is an isogeny between E and E primes that maps G to G prime. And the interesting uh, result that we have is that these graphs are also Ramanujan. Um, and the proof is very similar to the way you prove Ramanujanity for the usual super senior isogeny graph. Um, so it's more of modular forms and this kind of thing. So it's very deep mathematics, uh, very beautiful mathematics. But the interesting consequence is that we can use the mixing properties to give a very precise bound on how long you need to walk from the starting curve to get uh, to distributions that are statistically close. And so I put here the formula, of course, the formula is what it is. Um, there is an explicit constant which you can compute and which gives you that uh, the distribution will exponentially close converge to the to the stationary distribution on the exogenous graph, um, which gives us exactly what we were looking for: a zero knowledge proof uh, with statistical zero knowledge of knowledge of some isogeny work between two super singular curves. And now we didn't stop at the theory; we really implemented these things for the psych uh, primes. And we got parameters like concrete uh, examples uh, of non-interactive, so applying the Fiat-Schoenig transform, non-interactive proofs of knowledge of isogenies. And as you can see here, uh, these are huge. Uh, this is not what the kind of signatures you would like. You don't want to have half a megabyte of signature, like if you want to make signatures from those. So in a way, in a way we are very happy uh, about having the very first statistical ZK proof of knowledge for uh, the language of isogenies between super singular curves. On the other hand, this is very inefficient. And the reason it is inefficient, it's because this is a uh, one out of three uh, message uh, protocol. So the soundness error is two thirds. So the, the cheat improver can cheat with two thirds probability. So you need to repeat the protocol many times. And this is what this column means 
this is the number of repetition you need to make to for the protocol. And so if you repeat the protocol 200 times, that means that you have to transmit several hundreds of LT curves, several hundreds uh, kernels of isogenies. And this makes things quite as low and uh, quite big. But we're nevertheless very happy about this uh, because we're, and we're really going to run this protocol in a real world scenario soon. So stay tuned for, uh, for more. Uh, I wanted to say something about ski sign, but I'm totally out of time. So let me just finish with uh, the numbers. Um, the goal would be to reduce this kind of uh, proof sizes. Like, these proofs are huge. So they are good for some applications, but they're very bad for signatures. No one wants to use them in practice. Uh, if you want to make signatures, you would like to have some Sigma protocol where the soundness, soundness error is much lower, exponentially lower. Uh, and so instead of having challenges which are one out of two or one out of three, you would like to have challenges which are one out of exponentially many. And this is something that's easy to do with discrete logarithms, not easy at all to do with uh, complex multiplication group actions, but actually becomes doable in an interesting way uh, when you use uh, the action of uh, left ideals inside the quaternion algebra that's isomorphic to the endomorphism rings of super singular curves. So here it's full speed ahead. I'm not defining any of this, but I, I hope you have a little, at least a sense of how quaternion algebras are related to super singular curves. Um, and so you get in a way, what I like to think of as the next level of uh, unaffected correspondence. Like you had the discrete logarithm where exponentiation was what was linking uh, the exponents to the elements of the group. Then you have complex multiplication, which links the class group to uh, the super singularity curves. And now you have the Dorian correspondence, which links left side yields into maximal orders of quaternion algebras to super singular curves. And by doing the same kind of ideas that I showed you in the beginning, like you commit to some random curve, then you do something, that, then you receive some challenge and you do something more, so more kind of a, a committed diagrams you get to uh, ski sign, which is the currently most compact signature scheme uh, known today uh, for all level, all possible, uh, like uh, in the post quantum world. And that it's actually even more compact than our RSA signatures. Uh, it's only two to three times uh, larger than uh, ECDSA signatures. Um, so you will hear a lot about ski sign uh, in the next years because people are really excited about what uh, it can bring to the NIST post-quantum competition. So it will certainly be a candidate in the next round for signatures of the NIST post-quantum competition. And so this is also an invitation to look at it. Um, there's lots of open problems on Skisign. For example, zero knowledge is a terrible mess. Unlike what I showed you before, we don't really know how to prove zero knowledge for Skisign. Um, soundness is fine. It's very slow. Uh, there's lots, lots to do for ski sign. Uh, there's beautiful more mathematics. So if you are tempted to look into this, um, just uh, send me a message, ask questions. And uh, yeah, there's, this is really an invitation to, uh, to jump into the world of zero knowledge, proofs of knowledge of isogenies. So thanks for your attention. Sorry for being way over time. And if there are any questions. <laughs>